Welcome to Tell Us Something. Annabelle Winnie, who moved to Montana nine years ago, in part because, allegedly, she only lives in states that start with the letter M. Previously, she lived in Maine, Massachusetts, and New Mexico. She currently works as a clinical social worker in private practice. Past jobs have included research biologist, waitress, and burrito roller. Please welcome Annabelle Winnie. Last August, I was blissfully asleep when I became aware of something happening in my left ear. I rolled over, put my left ear down on the pillow, and waited for the water to drain out of my ear. When I was growing up, I spent a lot of time in pools, in the ocean, and lakes, and I was always getting water in my ear. I sat up in bed when I realized that I didn't go to the river that day, and I don't even think I took a shower before I went to bed. And the sensation in my ear was increasingly becoming more agitating. It was like I was a deep sea diver coming up from the bottom of the ocean as I became more and more awake and realized that something really weird was happening in my left ear. I sat up and tried to shake it out. I'm a very logical person. And when the sensations in my ear didn't match what I expected to happen, I got really agitated. I shook again. I expected there to be water in my ear, and I thought it should sloosh up on the left side. Whoosh. But that didn't happen. It was unpredictable and chaotic, and it burned a little bit, and it was really starting to freak me out. I wondered if maybe climate chaos was affecting my left ear. What if my brain was melting and I might actually be dying? And then it occurred to me, I was alone. My family was away. Even the dog was gone. For the first time in almost 20 years, I was having a crisis in the middle of the night and I was by myself. It flashed in my mind. In my pajamas, with this insane chaos in my ear, I could get in my car and drive to the emergency room. No, I'm not gonna do that. I got up, walked out of the bedroom to figure it out. But before I can tell you that story, I need to tell you this story. Why did I do that? I could have called an ambulance, I could have called 911. In moments like this, when our field of depth is so thin, we have our animal instincts and we have those paths already laid down in our brain. Really, I think I did what I did because I'm from Boston. Yeah, I'm from New England, I'm a mass hole. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you know, we're fucking tough, you know? Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? We take care of shit, right? Because when I learned how to drive, I learned how to drive in a city where the fucking pedestrians not only thought they owned the sidewalk, but also the street. So I'm driving a stick shift, the road's probably icy, and somebody's going to step out in front of my car in any moment. I am tough, man. You know, the few times I skied, really, I could have just brought my ice skates. I could have gone to the top of the ski hill, laced them up, and just skated down the hill because that shit was so icy, you know? What you call snow out here? Mm, that's styrofoam. Oh yeah, the shit at home, right? That's like cheesecake. Because the ocean's right there, it's really dense, right? So when I was a kid and we get a big dump of snow, it's like your car is ensconced in two feet of cheesecake, right? By the time you shovel that shit off your car and you clear out the spot, that shit is yours. You own it for the whole winter. <laughs> oh yeah, God forbid you actually have to get in your car and drive somewhere, it's the land of the law. You can put a trash can or a lawn chair in your spot, it's yours. <laughs> I mean, why else does anybody own a lawn chair? 
right? <clears throat> hey, Jimmy, you better go down to the hardware store and get me a lawn chair. Winter's coming. They're going to sell out. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> My neighbor man, when I grew up, one day I saw her. Somebody took her spot. She left the can there. They moved it. They took her spot. Oh, she was so pissed when she got back. I watched her. She, when that guy came to move his car, she stood out on the porch. She gave him the evil eye, and then she fucking told him exactly what she thought of him right to his face, right? Because that's what happens in Boston. People will tell you to your face that they don't like you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in my car and drive myself to the emergency room. No way. The thing is, though, we're really more like M&Ms. You know, we got this hot exterior, but inside, it's all soft chocolate, right? So I'm going to take care of this shit on my own, but inside, I am a fucking mess. I am so panicked. I leave my room, and I need my phone, right? Because it's got my flashlight. So I get my phone, go in the bathroom, turn on the light. Flashlight, nothing. It's just an ear. I'm freaking out. I'm really freaking out. And it's kind of starting to hurt. I take a picture. I expect to see blood or maybe like an alien tentacle. It's nothing. It's just my ear. Oddly, I get this strange picture like, it's like the scream. What am I going to do? Jesus Christ, what's going on? I got a little basket. I got earplugs. I, I don't have earplugs. I have nail clippers and I have tweezers. And I start to go from my ear. Thank God for sanity. No tweezers and eardrums, not a good idea. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then I see the bottle. Thank God my kids had lice. <laughs> Thank God it was August. Because every fucking August, my kids get lice. <laughs> right? So there's this bottle of rubbing alcohol on the counter because my kids have lice. Why? Because it makes me feel better. Rubbing alcohol does nothing for lice. <laughs> nothing. It doesn't stop them for a fucking second. <laughs> so I got my paper towel, but it makes me feel better. I got my paper towel, and I put the rubbing alcohol, and I comb my kid's hair for fucking ever, and then I clean it off on the rubbing alcohol. It makes me feel better. And in my head, I'm still like, water, pool, water, pool, because I'm very logical. So when I was a child, I always had my little bottle, half rubbing alcohol, half vinegar. I put it in my ear, and the pool water would come out, right? So I like get a cotton ball, and I'm squeezing, and then I just got the whole goddamn bottle. Like, what the fuck? And I'm, sh oh, I'm shaking my head. Oh, my God. It stops. This fucking insanity in my ear, it stops. I'm not going to die. My children won't be motherless. Oh, Jesus Christ, I look in the sink, and it's like crawling around. It's got like little segmented body parts, and it's like brown and reddish, and it's got these fucking pinchers on its head. It's an For Christ's sake. So what do I do? Booyah, I kill it. With my thumb, I smush it. It's fucking dead. Oh my God. <clears throat> I do find some earplugs. I'm not playing. I get some cheap dime store earplugs, and you know, like three hours later, I fall back asleep. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It took that long. <clears throat> Couple weeks later, early September, I go to two back-to-back -back shows right here at the Wilma. So fun, but you know, I'm middle-aged, so I have my expensive earplugs in my expensive rock concert earplugs in. So I go, I have fun. The day after the second show, I take my earplugs out, and I got a little buzz in my ear. You know, that happens, whatever. <clears throat> a couple weeks later, it's still there. That's kind of weird. A month later, it's still there. 
And I'm like, what is going on? And then it occurs to me, it's that fucking earwig. <laughs> he fucked up my ear. Damn. What am I going to do? I could go to a specialist. I could pay a lot of money. He'd look in my ear and say, yeah, you had an earwig in your ear. Uh-huh. Your hearing's damaged. You know what? Let that shit go. <laughs> so I do. I keep going. It's only recently that I even thought to stop and listen. It's still there. I have a little funk in my left ear because I had an earwig in it. But I got it out. And now, if you ever wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> and you think you're going fucking crazy, you will know just what to do. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Susan, you'll appreciate this. Um, <clears throat> Susan told me, stop reading so much. So I tried not to, and I forgot to say something that would have made Annabelle's story better for you. Tell us something has adult themes in adult language. <laughs> forgot to say that earlier. Sorry. <clears throat> Feather Sherman took art classes since she was six years old at Maryland Institute of Art. Then, eventually for two years at Schuler School of Fine Art. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Art Education from Towson University in Maryland and a Master's of Arts in Fine Arts from the University of Montana. She is passionate about peace, art, music, rainbow gatherings, her five awesome kids, and her grandbaby, Ryden Blue. Please welcome Feather Sherman. From my vantage point, just below the crown of a good-sized ponderosa on the wild side of the Clearwater River, I looked out as the beautiful dawn, the amber dawn, gradually lit the sky and the landscape below. It was so beautiful. I thank Great Spirit the life-giving force of the universe for the miracle of this new day. I took a deep breath, butterscotch. And then uh, my son was, had gotten up and he was starting to fix breakfast. So I started climbing down the tree to help him. And when I got about 20 feet above the ground, I paused. Ah, oh, that first cup of coffee is going to taste so good. Just then, an unknown force kicked my left foot off the branch it was on, as hard as you kick a football. And it kicked my right, it jerked my right foot off. And suddenly, I was hanging by my hands, 20 feet above the ground in midair. I was wearing my work gloves that had no buttons on them, and they were beginning to slip. Well, I knew I'd have to think of something pretty quick, so I decided uh, I'm strongest on my right side, so I'm going to hang on with my right hand, and then I'll let go with my left, and I'll wrap my arm around the tree, and then my other arm, and then I'll shimmy down till I get on some good limbs down below. And I thought, yeah, that's the best, that's the best plan. So I said, okay, here goes, and I let go with my left hand, and as I went to wrap my arm around the tree, my body swung out just far enough. I could just graze the side of the tree. I could not grab the trunk. 
and I realized that I was going down. In a matter of seconds, my right arm, my right hand slipped, and I began to fall. I thought, wow, 110 pounds, falling 20 feet, I'm going to be going really fast when I hit the ground. But I'm not going to know how, I can la how, how to land until uh, I discover if I'm going to get knocked around by the limbs. So uh, I'll just count. One 1,000, two 1,000. Okay, I'm almost to the ground. Now, how am I going to land? Let's see. Um, I don't want to land on my left side because I might burst my heart. So I'm going to roll to my right a little bit. And I'm going to want something to get around on. So I'm going to put my foot up. And uh, something's going to have to hit first. I guess it'll be the other one. And I'm going to tuck up a little bit. I'm like, okay, this is the best position. And then, a millisecond above the ground, I went, oh, shit. In this position, I'm going to break my neck. <laughs> but there's nothing I can do. I'll just have to do my best because here's the ground. And I hit. My body landed on the top of the ground. I felt absolutely no pain. But all the rest of me kept going in the same trajectory. Down, 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 I flew into the earth. And eventually, it was like being on a trampoline. And my speed slowed. And then I hit bottom. And then, boom, I was back up in my body. And then I felt the pain. I'd broken my foot and my back and actually several other parts, but those were the main injuries. And I was laying there and I thought, this is a miracle. I didn't break my neck. <laughs> this is an absolute miracle. And then I saw sparkles of silver and gold in the air. And I felt this spiritual being behind me, supporting my head, neck, and shoulders. I felt like a baby eagle tucked in the breast of my mother eagle, so safe and warm. And then the spiritual being very gently laid my head on the ground, and I'd landed on dirt and bunch grass, no rocks. Just then my son came running over to the tree, and he says, Mom, are you okay? And I said, Yes, I'm alive, and I didn't break my neck. I'm great. Look, I can wheel all this. And he's like, Wow. I said, well, we're going to have to call the helicopter. And uh, <laughs> I did break my back. I know that for sure. So pretty soon, they made it pretty quick in about half an hour. And as the EMTs came running over to the tree, one of them looks over and he goes, hey, we thought we'd find a 10-year-old kid under this tree, not a 50-year-old woman. I said, thanks a lot, you guys. I'm 64. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not in shock, and my vitals are normal. And they said, wow, that's great. How is your head and neck? And I said, they're fine, look. And I wiggled all over again to show them. And they said, well, we're going to bundle you up and take you into the hospital. So then we got to St. Pat's Hospital, and they did a beautiful job stabilizing my leg and getting me ready to have a clamshell brace and... About three days later, the doctor came into the, to my room, and he says, uh, where are you living right now? And I said, well, uh, uh, temporarily, I'm in a friend's basement, 17 steps down. And in actuality, I was going through a very difficult time in my life and going through a very hard breakup with my husband of 16 years. So that's why I was down in the basement. And... <clears throat> And he says, well, you know, you have a broken back. You can't use crutches. You, you, can't, you can't go there. And I said, oh, my friends will carry me up and down. And he's like, no, uh, you're going to have to find another place to stay. Or we're going to put you in a nursing home. And I'm like, oh, please, not that. So uh, I called everybody I could think of. And no one had room for me anywhere. And... I fell asleep, and when I woke up, I felt like I was in the bottom of this deep, dry well, and I was all alone, and there was no light and no sound. 
And I had never felt so alone and so helpless before in my whole life. But then I cheered up a little bit and I said, okay, Feather, what do you need now? And I said, I gotta talk to somebody who understands what I'm going through. So I thought, oh, I'll call David Milgram up in Flagstaff. He's a wonderful healer and we worked together with Grandfather David Menunge of the Hopis for 10 years during the 80s. So I called up David and let him know what had happened. And he goes, oh, Feather, you really did it this time. <laughs> but here's the good news. You're going to recover completely, and I'll help you. I'm going to help you with vitamins and minerals. And when we get off the phone, I want you to call this number. It belongs to a very powerful Lakota medicine woman named Susan, and she works behind the scenes. She lives in Colorado, so give her a call. And so I did. I thanked David very much, and I called Susan up on the phone. And I explained to her that I was a friend of David's and what had happened. And she goes, oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. She goes, I see you. You're way up in the air and surrounded by fire. Well, I was on the fourth floor of St. Pat's Hospital looking down at the helicopter pad. And seven and a half years ago, we were having a really bad fire season with Idaho on fire and southern Montana, and the valley was full of smoke. So I knew she saw me. And then she said, I'm doing a ceremony for you right now, and you're in the center. I'm calling in the four thunder beings of the West, because they're the most powerful protectorate spirits. And then seven male warrior spirits and seven female warrior spirits are around you right now and they're gonna protect you and help you to heal. And I want you to give a spirit offering for them before you have your food. And I said, yes, I'll be happy to do that. I've been taught that by Black Elk's great-grandson. And then she says, feel free to call me anytime. And just before she hung up the phone, she goes, oh, by the way, do you know who saved your life? And I said, I have a hunch. And she goes, you're right. It was your father, and he's here with me right now, and he's laughing, and he is so happy that he was able to help, and he's calling you Gidget. Gidget? I completely forgot that when I was a little girl, my dad called me Gidget because I loved the Gidget Goes Hawaiian and Gidget Goes to Summer Camp movies. And I thanked her so much and hung up the phone. And then my dad's spirit came right into the hospital room. And I raised up and we hugged each other in a beautiful golden ball of light and love. And I was able to thank him with all my heart. Thanks, Feather. How are we all doing? Yeah. Greg Monroe of Missoula is the father of two adopted daughters who are now adults with children of their own. In a long career as a trial lawyer, lawyer including 30 years as a law professor at the University of Montana, he has made storytelling the core of his advocacy and is awed by this ancient and beautiful communication. Please welcome Greg Monroe. Nineteen eighty three was a time of great anxiety for me and my wife. We couldn't get pregnant. We had tried everything. She had told me a couple of years earlier that her clock was running and that if we wanted to have children, we had to get at it. And the months were tough. We were making love according to formula. It was governed by temperatures and the time of the month. Each month was uh, started with hope and ended in despair. Ultimately, our doctors said, why don't you consider adopting? 
So we went to the oldest adoption agency, of the, the oldest of the five institutional adoption agencies in Montana, in Helena, Choder, uh, that was part of Choder Children's Hospital, and uh, uh, started with them. We met a wonderful social worker there named Becky Jones. And we knew what to expect. We'd seen the movies and heard the stories, and we knew that in, uh, infant adoptions through uh, institutional adoption agencies were totally secret. Uh, the mother gave up her child to the agency. The agency picked the parents, placed the baby, and she would never know what happened to the child. And the child, as the child grew up, would never know what happened or who, wh where she came from or who her natural parents were. Some of the agencies at that time were helping adult children find their birth parents if the birth parents consented. So Becky took us through uh, a course in adoption and to prepare us and then, uh, and confirmed that this was all to be completely secret and then uh, told us that, okay, you're expecting. I got the call in the middle of the afternoon in January from Becky she said, your baby's here. I was ecstatic. And then she said something ominous. She said, but there's problems. I thought, oh my God, is the baby blind? Does she have a cleft palate? Uh, are there legal problems? And Becky went on and told me what had occurred. They had gone to, she and the doctor, I think, went to uh, Corey's room. Corey was the birth mother. She was 15 years old. And Becky said to this 15-year-old, you were released, you're discharged, you can go back to the Florence Crittenden home. Now the Florence Crittenden home was a home for unwed mothers in Helena. And that's a place where when a young woman uh, or a girl uh, was starting to show that she was pregnant, could go there and stay for months and then have her baby and then go back to school and make up a story about where she'd been. So Becky said, you can go back to the Florence Crittenden home and then back to your hometown. And Corey said, and you're gonna place the baby today, right? And she said, no, we're not gonna do that. And she said, well, when will you place her? And she said, well, two or three weeks from now. And Corey said, what? And she said, well, two or three weeks from now. And Corey said, no, no, you've got to place her today. And she said, no, we don't do that. The agencies keep the baby for two or three weeks. Where will you keep the baby? Well, in a crib here, or we'll put her in foster care for the two or three weeks. Why would you do that? Well, it's a cooling off period in case you change your mind. I'm not going to change my mind. Look, you've got to place this baby with a mother today. And if you don't, I'm going to take her out of here and parent her myself, and I don't want to do that. Becky said... Corey, there's something I haven't told you. My mother died in North Dakota today, and my father is elderly and needs me. How about if I go to North Dakota and I take care of things with the family and take care of him, and I'll come back next week and we'll place the baby? No! You have to place the baby right now. It's got to be placed today. And she was in a jam, Becky was. She said, listen, I'm going to have to go talk to others in the adoption agency here. We'll decide what to do. We've never been faced with this before. And Corey said, yes, do that. And while you're at it, I want to meet the parents. I want to see this baby into the parents' arms. And, and I want it today. And she said, Becky said, we don't do that. No adoption agency does that. Uh, you can't meet the parents. And she said, listen, I'm going to take the baby out of here. So the agency had no choice. She met with them, and they decided, they'd never been faced with this before, and they decided that the only thing to do was call us. So on the phone, Becky had two questions of me. One, can you come to Helena right now and get your baby? And two, will you meet the birth mother? Instantly, I said, you bet, we'll do both. I need you to talk to my wife. And I hung the phone up, called Frontier Airlines, and as luck would have it, they had a flight leaving immediately. I picked the phone up to call my wife, and all the power in central billings went out. And I couldn't call her on our set, so I jumped in the car, raced to her office. She was a CPA clear across town. Ran in and said, our baby's here. <laughs> and we, we hugged, we cried. And uh, 
they were, they were raced up to the hospital. And St. Vincent Hospital gave or lent baby infant seats to parents who were taking children out of the hospital because that was back in the days when people still drove around in cars carrying babies in their arms. So we flew to Helena and we met, uh, we went to the restaurant, we'd agreed to meet out near the airport. And Becky was there and uh, the little girl, Corey, was there. Corey was carrying a stuffed panda bear and in its arms was a, was a baby stuffed panda bear. And she, and she handed it to us and said, this is for your baby. And we had a wonderful dinner. I don't know how I got the dinner. As you might guess, I'm very emotional. <laughs> but Corey was very engaging, self-confident. We loved her. It was really great. And we had a very good time with her. And we, uh, and the funny thing, we asked her about her interest, and she said, I love riding horses. And we said, well, do you have horses of your own? She said, no, I go to Fairmont all the time. So we knew she was from Anaconda. And so we agreed to go where the baby was and take pictures all together, and then we'd take her back to the Florence Crittenham home, which we did. It was really fun taking pictures. We went back to the Florence Crittenham home and left. Corey went into the home, and you can imagine what she had to say. And the word spread like wildfire what this 15-year-old had done. Skipping ahead, we, there, were, there were legal problems, as a matter of fact. Corey had exercised her right of privacy and refused to identify the father. Frankly, she told a story that was pretty bogus. Uh, and uh, so about a year, yeah, less than a year after these events, Corey wrote a letter to the agency, to Becky, and penciled out this letter saying, I was just wondering, I need to see the baby and the parents one more time to make sure that she's safe and secure. So, and she said, I know this might not be possible, and it's okay if it isn't, but if we can, I'd really like to do it around her first birthday. And she signed it, and then across the bottom of the letter, she wrote in big letters, please, and I, and I said to the agency, how would we ever say no to that? So we drove to Helena on a Saturday, and we all agreed to meet at Chaudaire, and we drove up to the curb, and there was only one car parked there, and that was from Anaconda, of course. And we went in, and we met Corey. She looked wonderful, and she was just great. And she had a boyfriend with her, and he was blonde. He had a broad nose, just like the adorable nose my daughter had. And frankly, I took one look at him and thought, this is the father of this baby. We had a wonderful meeting with him. And I suspected that we might hear more from Corey. And by the way, we were advised before dinner and before this meeting that we wouldn't identify, use no last names, and would not talk about where we were from. And because we had to maintain the secrecy. So, on that Saturday, we met, took pictures and all that, and then we did something that was not scripted, and I don't know to this day how the agency felt about it, but we agreed with Corey that we wouldn't get together again and have no contact until Andrea was old enough to ask questions, and that the day that she asked to meet her birth mother, we'd get back in touch with the agency and we'd get together. And that's exactly what happened. And I think it was when Andrew was about five and a half years old. And we got together with her. And both of our daughters have grown up knowing their birth mothers and having uh, whatever contact they wanted to have with them. And uh, the word spread so fast that all of the agencies were forced to change. And today, in Montana adoption, it's within just a couple of years, it became policy that if you wouldn't meet the birth parents, you went to the bottom of the priority pile or you didn't get a baby at all. And I think that we've all learned in the meantime that it is so much more human to have open adoptions. And for all the ups and downs, it's better to see the roadmap 
and better for children's identity. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you to all of our storytellers so far tonight. Uh, thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters as well, Bonnie Curian and Denise May. Thank you to our title sponsor, The Good Food Store, and thank you to all of our sponsors. Logjam presents the Wilma CabinetParts.com, Missoula Broadcasting Company, Axis Physical Therapy, Clearwater Credit Union, Gecko Designs, Enlightened Labs, Fieldy Design, and Missoula Bone and Joint. When you frequent these businesses, please thank them for their support of Tell Us Something and of live storytelling in Missoula. And thank you for being here tonight. Without you, Tell Us Something can't happen without your loves, your open hearts, and your open ears. If you are interested in potentially joining Tell Us Something as a board member, be in touch. You can contact us via the website at tellussomething.org. Finally, the next Tell Us Something event is March 25th. The theme is Lost and Found. We are, yeah. <laughs> we are taking story pitches for that right now. To pitch your story, go to tellussomething.org and click Tell a Story. You'll get all the information you need right now right there. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute intermission, grab a drink, stretch your legs, come back in 10 minutes for audience participation. Thank you so much. Welcome back. I would like to introduce you to my two friends, Lauren and Ryder, who are going to walk us through the audience participation portion of the evening. Does one of you want to step over here so I can get the mic down? Uh, right angle. I, I got it. Thank you. All right, so this is the first audience participation story. Tipping point or tipping over? I woke up in shivers after a night of drinking tequila and eating mescaline. I shook off a layer of frost and found that I was chained to my motorcycle. What the fuck? I walked to the bar and grill in Alberton and ordered breakfast. The guy behind the bar slid, to my, slid my coffee down the bar, soon followed by eggs and bacon. How rude, I thought. I tossed him my money and walked out. The ride home was freezing, so when I got home, I curled up in bed until late afternoon. Upon rising, I went to the bathroom. After peeing, I looked in the mirror and was shocked to see that I had burrito puke in my bushy beard. I no longer drink tequila. One day, my husband said to me, if you can't be passionate about me and this life, then you should leave today. That was 20 years ago, and I've never seen him since. All right. It was mid-August. I was on a large, faded, orange-colored raft from the 1970s named Marge about to voyage down Tumbleweed, a rapid in the Alberton Gorge. I forgot to mention, it was my first time rowing, ever. I will let the pictures say the rest. I spent three years living in Minneapolis, where it's so cold in the winter, it hurts your face. My commute to work was about 45 minutes in start and stop traffic. It was my third winter there, and I was driving home in the freezing snow. I called my boyfriend and told him I had to make a change. I couldn't do another winter there. He was on board. We made a list of cities we would want to move to and started applying for jobs. We both got jobs in Missoula within a week of each other, having have lived here together for the past two years and we're getting married here this summer. Well, I'm not comfortable sharing this story on social media, I do think it's a story that needs to be told. 
As a wayward but well-intentioned 17-year-old, I brought my girlfriend, now wife of 41 years, home a half hour later than her curfew. Her father put her luggage on the front porch. Even I, an obtuse rider of the testosterone tsunami, figured out the message. Instead of slinking, however, my wife and I went in, woke up my new in-laws, and had it out with, uh, had it out with them regarding my intentions. This month, our nine and five-year-old granddaughters will join us at my father-in-law's house for Christmas, and I am attending tonight's Tell Us Something with my daughter, who remains a golden light of my life. Thanks. It was the eve of my th birthday. As I tipped into my 30s, I found myself 14,000 feet in the air, strapped to a heavily tattooed stranger. It was then that I realized that I had passed the point of no return. This was my tipping point. Seems more like a tip than a story, but... Moving the decimal one place to the left, that's 10%. Double it for nice gratuity. That's my tipping point. November 8th, 2016. <laughs> in high school, my daughter used to put her clothes in the dryer to warm her clothes up every morning. I finally snapped and started turning off the dryer breaker. I had $40 in my pocket and I had not yet made my destination having traveled from Missoula to Zurich, Switzerland. It was 10 p.m., I was 19 and still had miles to go. Would I make it? Where would I sleep? <laughs> when I had nothing more I could give you and you couldn't even give me the time, that was my tipping point. Thanks, guys.